Well, Sir John, welcome back to Chatham House. Thank I've you. had the pleasure of moderating you here at the Institute on a number of occasions, normally in a formal setting where you've had to speak uh, to our members, um, but it's just a great privilege and a real pleasure to be able to have you here for a more intimate conversation. Um, so if I could just start right at the beginning. Um, what do you feel is most different? Does this feel like an exceptionally risky and dangerous time? We have a pretty uh, uh, transactional and outspoken president in Washington. We have a very tough and rising China. Um, we have a Russia that seems to be reinserting itself after the end of the Cold War um, into all sorts of areas of the world. Uh, as you look at this, does it feel exceptionally risky or is this the kind of way the world looked but with different cast of characters when you were in office? One of the few virtues of age is you can talk about then and now uh, because you remember then uh, very plainly. Um, today is different. The risks are perhaps more on the economic side than the military side than they were. But in the 1980s, of course, one wasn't sure of the uh, uh, military risks that existed at that time, uh, certainly until the collapse of the Berlin Wall in the late uh, 1980s. But I think there's no doubt that diplomatically and in terms of internationalism, it is a trickier time now than it was. There is an increasing tendency for countries that were internationalist to become more nationalist. Mm -hmm. And that is extremely worrying. It utterly undercuts diplomacy. It certainly undercuts uh, international agreements. It exposes very clearly how the post-war settlement is now wholly out of date, whether you're talking about the financial institutions or perhaps most glaringly of all the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different time. And in many ways, the risks are different. There were no risks in the 80s and 90s that I could foresee then of serious trade wars. That risk exists now. There were um, a series of, if one says small wars, I don't mm -hmm. wish to undermine the, the, the Gulf Wars, but regional wars, yes. perhaps is a better way of putting it. Um, I don't think that risk has materially increased, except that one does look rather cautiously at the extent to which China is rearming mm. and at the mischief that Russia is knowingly creating, mm. not just in Syria, but right across the Middle East and in East, uh, Eastern Europe. And if you were to, uh, you brought up that point about China arming, rearming, um, <coughs> there is this kind of view out there that at some level conflict is almost inevitable between the United States and China, that with a great power rising, like China, with a country like the United States realizing for the first time in certainly recent history, and certainly since it's been at the top of the pile, that there's a country coming along that might compete with it. I mean, if you were in office, would you be thinking th this really is a risk that's going to have to be managed almost like the kind of Soviet US times of, of the uh, Cold Well, War? I would think conflict, yes, but not necessarily military conflict. Mm. There's certainly going to be going to be and is economic conflict. Yeah. There are certainly tensions. The um, um, the military establishments that China has put on outcrops in the South China yeah. Sea, the extent to which China appears to be ignoring the normal international laws in the South China Sea, the extent to which they seem to be appropriating, I use a kind word, other people's intellectual property. All that is a cause of conflict, but it's more likely to be economic and diplomatic conflict, I think, than, uh, than military conflict. I'd be very surprised with its internal problems if China was prepared to engage in any military conflict unless it was given no choice. Right, right. If uh, it was embarrassed, if its face was hurt, then it is conceivable. But my judgment is that people wouldn't be that foolish and the Chinese wouldn't be so unwise as to respond. What they are doing, beyond doubt, is taking the view that because they are now a great economic power, they must necessarily be an increasingly significant military power as well. Mm. They have probably over two million uh, members in their, in their army. They're developing a much larger fleet above and below the sea it is uh, the Navy that they mm -hmm. are principally developing. Mm -hmm. 
and you can argue that that is for offensive or you can argue it's for defensive capacity. I think it's probably predominantly defensive and for reputational purposes above all. And when you, I mean, I would imagine that one of the big differences between <coughs> your time in office and today is that we've kind of gone through this period of intense globalization where it certainly strikes me, and I think my colleagues at Chatham House, that even though we're in a more competitive environment, um, the world is ever more interdependent, whether it's dealing with climate change, big pandemics, managing global financial risks, uh, uh, the challenges of, 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 of global development um, with the rise of Africa, certainly in terms of population. In, in that kind of interdependent environment, I presume from where I'm sitting that we're doomed to have to work with a country like China. You could sit in two camps between maybe the Soviet <coughs> Union and the West, but would you be in the school that says we're going to have to find a way to work with China even if we don't agree on a lot of things? Or uh, would you have some sympathy with the current US administration that seems to be saying, you know what, we need to put China in a box? Um, I don't think you can put China in a box and I don't think it'd be wise to try. Of course we must deal with China. China does things we don't like. The United States does things that we don't like. So I don't think you should suddenly put China in a box. China is a, a remarkable growing power. It's becoming internationalist in a way I never thought that I would see in my lifetime. Now I welcome that. Economically, to have an economic giant in the East, as well as two economic giants in the West, in the European Union and America, provides a much better balance mm. for the world economy, much less likely to get the sort of recessions and the sort of damage we had in the past. That has to be good news. The danger with that is the extent to which China is so dominant in Asia, mm -hmm. the extent to which so many nations become increasingly dependent upon it, and because they are dependent upon it, subservient to it. Um, but I think you have to bring China into the world economy, not try and exclude her. Excluding her won't work, and it's the very re reverse of what good diplomacy would suggest. I mean, uh, and I think, well, you're already hinting at some of the themes that we as Chatham House <laughs> should be focused on, I think, in the future with your comments there about how to manage this rise of China. But let me just turn for a second to Europe again in the scene setting bit, if I can, at the beginning here. Um, <coughs> you had great experience of the European Union. You knew many of the, the great leaders um, of the late 20th century, François Mitterrand, Helmut Kohl, amongst others. Um, when you look at Europe today, uh, do you feel it's, it's on a linear journey, even if hesitant and with a few three steps forward, maybe two and a half steps back towards a journey of integration that you would recognize from your time in office? Or as you look at it now from the outside, uh, do you have some level of concern that the European Union may be coming apart a little bit at the seams politically and or institutionally? I don't think Europe is going to collapse as some people forecast and other people hope. I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't think that's going to happen for, uh, um, for historical reasons. At the end of the war, the Europeans looked round. They saw the power of America across the Atlantic. They foresaw the rise of China and to a lesser extent, Japan. And they realized that if the European nations all bankrupt immediately after the war, remained as individual nation states without working together, they would be pygmies in a world of giants. Mm. And that was the uh, emphasis that began to draw together the iron, steel and coal community, the common market, and then the European Union. So th that, that was the impetus that did it. And I think two, three generations have grown up with that. I do not believe that is going to collapse. That said, I do think it has gone awry. It's gone awry because it has tried to move too far too fast. Mm. In particular, the establishment of the euro currency before there was convergence of the economies of those members was a mistake that has caused huge economic surpluses in Germany that Germany won't spend, mm. though we, Europe could do with them spending it, and deficits across the whole of Southern Europe with very high unemployment, particularly among young people, and a certain degree of uh, economic, well, if not collapse, uh, an economy that seems frozen mm. and unable mm -hmm. to advance. And, and I think the second big mistake they've got was 
the enlargement of Europe was politically desirable. Politically desirable to bring the Visegrad countries out of the Soviet bloc and into the free market bloc of the West. But what, of course, has happened, in, uh, partly in pushing those countries too far too fast, is the Visegrads, with their past history, are not prepared mm. to play the same game as the Western European countries and uh, submerge themselves within the wider European Union in the same way. And so you've now got a large dissentient bloc right. within the European Union. And with 27 nations, it is very hard to get a measure of agreement mm -hmm. on anything other than the most broad outlines. Yeah. So I do think Europe needs to pause, perhaps for quite a few years, think about what it is, think about how far it can move forward, think about the extent to which it can meet the problems it has, and think in particular about how outraged even the populace of the Western nations are mm -hmm. of the extent of European bureaucracy and the extent to which their national governments have now been, if not undermined, at least are less in control of events than they were. All this can be reformed, but they are going to have to stop using these silly slogans that the solution is more Europe mm -hmm. and think about the reality of what public opinion and economic necessity determines. And in that context, part of the drive for this continued <coughs> effort integration We've seen effort, efforts in the areas of migration, in some of the forms of uh, um, intelligence, or at least information sharing, <coughs> justice and home affairs, judicial areas, of climate regulation. But underneath that, the euro has created almost an instability that without deeper integration, the danger is that it won't be ready for the next crash or the next financial crisis when it comes. So by launching the currency, you said before it was ready in terms mm. of convergence of the economies, uh, nonetheless, is it not the case that having got to where they are, they're stuck you know, on two sides of a river with maybe the current getting harder? They're going to have to step <coughs> to one side or the other. They are, but I don't think they can do so immediately. Mm. I mean, I think they are going to have, in terms of the Eurozone itself, rather than the wider social issues, they are going to have to deepen and uh, act more closely together with greater coordinated uh, accounting and greater coordinated decision making. But they cannot do that at the moment. Even core European countries like the Dutch are resisting that because they are going too fast. Politicians may dream their dreams, mm -hmm. but they cannot lead if no one will follow them. And if the public will not follow those movements, and at the moment the public appear not to be willing to follow, then they are going to have to pause. That is why I say they should pause, refresh what they've got, think about it, perhaps look at how they can instill a little more genuine democracy in the way Europe works. I do not want Europe to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. I do not want it to fall apart. Mm -hmm. But I do see its fallacies. I do see its faults. And if it is to succeed in the long term, it is going to have to address some of those faults and admit to them. Mm -hmm. It is not a perfect creation as it is at the moment. So maybe an element of sort of the insecurity of not <laughs> wanting to admit to something, you're worried that you pull at the thread and the whole thing uh, comes apart. I suppose it, it brings me inevitably to the question of what impact the UK's current decisions you think may have looking to the future. Here we are with Chatham House trying to at least peer five or ten years forward, if not another hundred years. Um, uh, I, I don't want to put the, 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 the boundaries of this conversation, assume the UK has left or not, or however you want to play it, but the UK's uh, decision to flow from its 2016 referendum do you see it as being an accelerator of some of these problems for the EU? Will it even perhaps be able to work better without the UK as a troublesome uh, player in the middle of it? Um, uh, you know, how do you see Brexit, the debate over Britain leaving, affecting Europe? If you, you know, starting um, from that <coughs> side first, maybe. Then we'll come to Britain and what we do. Um, I think it will affect Europe negatively for a number of reasons. We always tend to concentrate in the UK about what leaving Europe means for the UK, and that's perfectly understandable. We're British. But turn, as it were, the telescope round and ask what the UK leaving Europe means for Europe. Mm. Well, firstly, it loses its second largest economy. And until the referendum, after which the British economy began to go sour, uh, the best performing economy. They lose 
one of only two European nations, the other being France, with a significant nuclear capability and a, a conventional capacity. They lose also in the UK the country that has the longest and deepest foreign policy reach mm -hmm. around the world. In addition to that, they upset the institutional balance of Europe. Yeah. Without the British, there is no certain majority for free markets. There may be a majority for protectionism, which yeah. would be a disastrous route for Europe to go down. They lose also in Britain the country that so often stood alone, apparently, but wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. There were lots of small nations who wished Britain to be the difficult man, but they didn't want to put their head above the parapet because they were net recipients from the European budget. Time and again, I remember facing something on my own and then being approached by one of the smaller <laughs> European nations who said, well, thank heavens you did that. <laughs> we so agree with you. And I would say, well, why didn't you say so? It would have been helpful. <laughs> and they say, ah, but, 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 but we are net recipients. Yeah, yeah. We don't feel we ought to do that. And then, of course, not only was Britain the bulwark between the Franco-German juggernaut, they were also the country that was so often the one best able to deal with any difficulties that were felt by the Visegrad countries. And all that has gone. Mm. And Europe will miss that. And if I may say so rather arrogantly on behalf of Britain, I think they will miss the pragmatic and questioning nature mm -hmm. of the British involvement in Europe. The enthusiasts may leap away with some new idea without any break to hold them back. And so I think Europe will lose quite significantly. At the moment, the world has three great economic centres, mm -hmm. America, China, Europe. Europe is suddenly going to fall to a slightly bigger dimension by losing its second largest economy and being stuck as it probably is in low or no growth for quite a period to come. So I presume from that your viewpoint would be that if the UK <coughs> leaves the EU as currently planned, um, there will be a massive emphasis uh, there should be an emphasis on the EU side of trying to have as close a relationship with the UK as possible, economically certainly, and probably politically as well, and I presume in the UK's interest as well. Would you be a, I mean, and I'll put my own cards on the table here, my, my sense has been in a way the irony of Brexit is that the UK will end up uh, having Europe or the European Union as its principal external relationship in the future rather than maybe going global? Or do you think the UK will be forced to look out a little bit more afterwards? Well, I think the concept of Britain going global is about 300 years too late. <laughs> I mean, it was absolute nonsense, the, su the thought that Britain is suddenly going to leave mm. Europe where half its market is and suddenly go global. It is a copper-bottomed, crass nonsense and always was. <laughs> We've been global for 300 years. Um, it may be that the Brexiteers don't realise it, but we once had an empire which is quite global. So that, I mean, that is complete nonsense. Do I think it is desirable for us to remain very close to Europe? Yes, I do. I think it is a great shame, a great loss, that we are leaving the European Union. I understand the feelings that made people leave, the frustrations, the 30 years of misreporting, yeah. the 30 years of Europe being blamed for everything. I understand why it was our public voted for that, but I think it was a mistake. It was a mistake for us, and it was a mistake for Europe. And Europe's success matters to us because whether we are part of the European Union or not, they are our biggest neighbour. Um, their security and our security is inextricably linked and we need the best possible relationship with them, not least in matters like uh, uh, crime and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and detection. So I think leaving Europe is, yeah. is folly for us and very damaging for them. So let me just bring you a little bit onto the political side, uh, doing politics today, because it's, again, as an outside observer of how British governments have managed their relationship with the EU in particular, it is almost as if many British politicians did not feel they had a sense of agency as part of an organisation of 27, 28, with the UK in there currently, and maybe more in the future, member states. And that there's some sense that outside the EU, the UK might end up actually doing things that it'll stop doing. It'll start thinking more actively about what a trade policy might be. It'll have to face up to whether 
it collaborates on European foreign policy, maybe as an outside player, whereas before we were always a blocker. Um, could you see any positives about just knowing how the British psyche has worked politically that maybe, I hate to group everyone into this, into this uh, 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 cadre, but that British politicians were never good at playing European politics internally. And that in a way we were always sort of the resistors and because we were that, we, we couldn't have as much influence maybe as we should have done. And therefore outside, actually the UK may just get more engaged in thinking about foreign policy, even with Europe. Well, there's a paradox here. There's a paradox in saying we aren't involved with Europe and, and we stand on the outside looking in, because there's some truth in that. Um, but it is also true that there is no nation that has been able to negotiate with Europe to the extent that it's had so many advantages that the other European countries haven't managed mm. to attain. Mm. We have. And uh, that is because of the way we have approached Europe. And it isn't just a question of saying, no, give us this or we'll throw our toys out the pram. It's been much more subtle than that in gaining many of the changes that we have actually have got. But it's also to tr true to say we're on the outside looking in, in a different fashion. We British are an island. Mm. Um, and we actually, we think differently from the way the continental mind works. It's quite possible for us to have a conversation with a continental leader and we both come away with a different impression mm. of what was agreed. Now, the other point is this. Weekend after weekend, the leaders of France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, tend to spend weekends often, or the politicians, not necessarily the leaders, with one another. Mm -hmm. When they're contemplating a new European policy, it's, it's half the way down the slipway before the British learn about it because mm. it's only at that stage mm. it's actually mm. brought to the European Council. Now, if we had invited them over to Chequers, mm. if we had intermingled with them at the same time, yeah. we would have been immensely more influential. But we chose not to. Yeah. And that is partly because of the nature of our politics. Mm. It is much tougher to be a minister in the UK than in any other country. Mm. In every other country, they don't have the same fierce questioning parliament. They don't have the sheer weight of work in many countries, and they certainly don't have the constituency responsibilities that every minister up to and including the prime minister has in the UK. And of course, they're geographically closer to one another, so the relationship is closer. So it is actually rather, rather different, the whole tenor and mood of politics is different here from the way it is so often in, uh, in Europe. And that has worked to our disadvantage, not because we have necessarily been idle in making friends in Europe, though often we have, often we have, but because many of our senior ministers have been so burdened, mm -hmm. they deal with Europe when Europe happens to come up with an agenda item. They don't deal with Europe in the formation of those agenda yeah, items. Yeah. Some of their officials may know, the officials who are based in Europe, but it isn't actually in the political body as a whole. And that is a loss for us. Do you think the British Always has been. But do you think the British system um, has the capacity then to be more resilient? Right now it looks chaotic to many people. We have mm. many visitors coming to Chatham House. You know, what's going on in British politics? We thought you were the pragmatists, the famous phrase, we're British, we know what we're doing, seems to be a little bit uh, at least questioned today. And, and yet I find myself sometimes saying that when I think of, of a constitutional system, and it's a system rather than a constitution, that is quite resilient, I think Britons maybe will prove to be through this. There's definitely a search for more accountability from citizens. Um, a, a sort of a much more questioning electorate. Do you feel it's sort of different today that the that the British public are looking for something different from their politicians. And in a way, the whole Brexit thing is an effort to try to reconnect politicians and the public. Or is that putting too much of a silver lining on it? Our politics is, for the time being, in a mess. I don't think it will remain in a mess for good. Will there be some structural changes? It's very difficult to say. It's not impossible. But structural changes in British politics are pretty hard to bring about. It takes generations to make a political party. 
and it will probably take a great deal to break up a political party. So I wouldn't think anybody should actually rely on that. But I have never known such a period of disaffection for politics and for politicians as exists in our country and in Europe and in the United States mm. as we see at the present time. Now, what are the reasons for that? Because I think the reasons explain how we may get out of it. Yeah. Um, there are a number of reasons. Um, the principal one among them was the 2007-2008 financial crash. There are individuals and families today who are worse off 10 years on, 12 years on, than they were in 2006, 2007. That is unprecedented yeah. in British politics. Absolutely unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have got a whole generation now, now of voting age, that have grown up with austerity. Mm. People wondered why the Labour Party Against Expectations polled so heavily among the young. All the young can remember, if they voted in the 2017 election, is austerity. Mm. Whether it's their families, housing, benefit, or whatever else it may be, it's been austerity all the, li all the way. And with austerity, you lose something. Mm. Not just money, you lose hope. Mm. You lose the, the belief that tomorrow is going to be better than today. Right. And the biggest single mover of political instinct is hope. Mm. The belief that things are going to get better. Now that is not there. Has not been there in recent years. Mm. It may yeah. just be beginning to return, but it's only in its infancy if it is. Once we can engender some hope, I think our political system will stabilise again um, and be more familiar to us than it is at this present time. But that does mean economic growth. When you look at, if I want to bring a, another big theme that's out there and one that Charlie <coughs> House is definitely uh, very much involved in thinking about, technology, automation, uh, the changing nature of work, um, the globalization of economic opportunity that often leaving pockets then of those who maybe didn't have a good education mm. far behind. Mm. These could be, just as maybe one is stabilizing after the financial crisis, <coughs> we may face quickly on its heels uh, a more technology and innovation driven crisis that could create new senses of loss of hope. When you think about this technology revolution as it's described today, is it something kind of on the periphery of your vision or do you see it running through the core of the, the problems we're facing today and maybe the future? Well, it has been on the periphery, but it's moving to centre stage. And it's moving to centre stage uh, extremely quickly. And it has some profa a profound impact on British policy way beyond industry and commerce. Uh, the first place it's going to impact uh, on Britain is in the education system. Mm. Unless we change the structure of our education and move to the sort of position where age 14 and 15 people can begin to, fo uh, to focus on technolo technology or alternative technology, mm -hmm. uh, academia, or alternatively on the traditional skills that we will need, particularly if we block migration, right. then you begin to see a different structure of education. We're always going to need people who can build houses. Right. We're going to need electricians. We're going to need plumbers. All the, all the jobs that other mm -hmm. people have taken when we've had shortages, if they're not going to be here, and that seems to be the public will, wrongly in my view, mm -hmm. but it seems to be the public will, then we are going to have to change our academic structure and our post-school training structure to make sure that people can actually learn the skills for those jobs. Yeah. And that will take up a lot of the slack in terms of uh, the people who will find their existing jobs gone. But many of the people who will find their jobs gone will be people, will be white collar jobs. Mm. And uh, the trouble when technology takes over is that they create a small number of very highly paid jobs for people who are really skilled and a much larger number of relatively poorly paid mm. jobs mm. with poorly paid opportunities. So that is going to be one of the really big problems for. Uh, British politicians and commerce and industry over the next 20 years. Just one more question about the context, and I want to come into to Chatham House and kind of what this conversation maybe has animated in your mind about where, where we might go. Um, 
do you think <coughs> politicians need with different skill sets? What does the politics of the past should be able to work as effectively today, or do we need to rethink democracy? I think of my daughters who are actually becoming more politically mobilized at one mm. level, but don't seem to have any affinity to political parties mm. per se, or to platforms, but they do feel very mobilized about their future, and I would say actually very thoughtful about, s about the contributions they want to make to society. Uh, I mean, uh, if I may digress, that's my experience too. Going around talking to six horns, whether it's very famous schools or mm. everyday schools, um, there's no doubt that young people are less partisan, less party political, less far left or far right um, at 16, 17 and 18 than I remember them being 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah. But more engaged in what politics means mm. and how it might develop, uh, which I think is, uh, is an attractive trait for the, uh, uh, for the future. Um, do we need different politicians? Well, I think there is a danger that we have strayed into, that we have too many professional politicians, all of whom believe they have the Prime Minister's baton in their knapsack. <laughs> and um, we have lost the farmers. We have lost the people coming into politics in the middle years. Mm. We have lost the businessmen. We have lost the miners, um, because there mm. aren't many miners left, of course, sadly, but we've lost people who've done manual work yep. and really understand how the people who have very little really okay. live. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. Labour Party has lost that, and the Tory Party has lost the vast spread yeah. of, um, of people. The improvement, of course, to balance that is ethnically we have a much better mix Ethnically and in terms of the sexes, we have a much better mix in Parliament than has ever been before. But that's not true if you're seeking for a mix of people's life experience. And that is a loss, and it's a loss the political parties should try and put right. Well, so you know, so we, we might find people coming in through the political party at the national level, or we may find, like you, people coming in maybe more at the local level, as you did right at the beginning of your political mm. career, at the, at the sort of council level or the town level or the city level, I suppose there may be a, have to be a different type of politics that's more distributed, more disaggregated maybe in the future? Or is it all still around London and that central parliament? No, 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 no. I mean, we, we have got to reshape the degree of national capital investment away from London and the southeast and more to towards the Midlands and the north. I mean, I just ask a single question. Is it acceptable that in the whole of the United Kingdom, only London, the South East and East Anglia are net contributors to the Treasury budget. Mm. Everybody else is a net recipient. Yeah. That cannot be acceptable yeah. and must not be accepted. So we do need, when we started talking, when uh, George Osborne and David Cameron started talking about uh, investment in the North, they were right, but it isn't only the North, it's the South West. Yeah, exactly. It's many other parts of the country as well. And we have either got to accelerate our capital investment or divide the capital investment we make more accurately. Mm -hmm. And of course, if the government deal with the structural issues, roads, rail, ports, then you're going to get a much greater attraction to the private investor mm -hmm. going to those parts of the country. And that has to be a key part of the strategy. I know it's very old hat to talk of a national plan because whenever we've had one, it's failed. But we do need a national audit, mm. a national audit of what we've got and what we should have if we're going to offer the same life chances to a boy in Sunderland as you offer to a boy or a girl mm. in, um, in East Surrey. Yep, yep. And we should. We talk of uh, social mobility. Social mobility has declined. It has declined because we don't have the houses that people can rent and move to in other parts of the country. We don't have the council houses we yeah, did. Yeah. I have no objection with selling council houses and making people homeowners. Great. But the second half of that equation didn't occur, which was using the money from the sale of council houses mm. to build more council houses. Without that, you do not have the social mobility that people talk about. As you look at this sort of panoply of international issues in particular, but also the way the UK experiences the world domestically, um, you know, what do you think absolutely has to be on the agenda of a place like Chatham House? 
Well, I suppose if you tried to describe it in one word, it would be tomorrow. What is tomorrow going to be like? What is tomorrow going to be like diplomatically? Who's going to be allied to whom? Where are the problems going to be? What are the difficulties, economic, social, political, that are going to build up in different parts of the world? How do we marry diplomacy to outcomes? Because mm. unless diplomacy produces and you're in trouble, that is going to be a key part of what you have to look at. And then socially, you're going to have, have to look at, I hope, the way the world is changing. The problem for governments is the world is changing so far, almost every government is struggling to keep up with what has happened or what is happening. Yeah. What Chatham House has to look at is what is going to happen yeah. in order to inform both industry and commerce and politics and government. Because we are going to have to move into a world, the speed at which things are changing, in we, which we plan for what is going to happen, mm -hmm. so we are ready mm -hmm. when it happens, rather than struggling to catch up after it has happened with the maximum amount of dissent amongst people who are hurt. And if you It's a different agenda. It's definitely a different agenda, and, and I think one where uh, the danger for think tanks is you keep getting pulled into the present, in many cases by your constituencies mm. and government who are more and more obsessed about the present. Mm. So you're absolutely right. I think we have to discipline ourselves as much as possible in the future. But you but can't ignore the present, yeah. Yeah. Um, not least because you may be asked to do it. Mm. But it is out of the present that the future springs. If you wish to examine tomorrow, you need to look at the trends that are barely noticeable now but are beginning to build up that are there today. If you notice those trends, you can see what is going to happen. And perhaps I can give you a practical example mm -hmm. in Africa. Africa, we know, is going to grow, outgrow every other part of the world in terms of population in the next 20 years or so. Yeah. It's going to need whole cities, yeah. not just small towns. It's going to need whole cities. It's going to need a complete structure to provide water for Africa. The Nile can't provide the water all the way down to Uganda yeah. today in the way that it did in 1900. Where is the infrastructure to deliver that water? Who is going to pay for it? It mm. cannot be mm. done by those countries. They don't have the money. But without the water, you can't develop. Mm -hmm. Without developing, you're going to have a huge number of extra people in Africa seeking to come to the Middle East or Europe or elsewhere. It is in the interests of the developed countries to foresee the problems in the underdeveloped countries yeah. and try and head them off by making those places more amenable for people to live in and also much more effective and productive markets. And that isn't always easy to sell. Consider how difficult it is to sell overseas aid to many people, even in the most advanced countries. And yet, apart from it being common humanity, in many ways, it's common sense if you're looking at the interests of your children and your grandchildren. And at the speed at which the world moves today, we have got to do that. We have got to look intergenerationally. Democracy has a very poor record recently at looking intergenerationally. Mm. Autocracy, which does not have to answer to an electorate, is much more able to look intergenerationally because it's not bothered who it offends in the short term and it can push aside people who need help now. And democracy must deal with those. So it's, it's less free and it has less resources to look at the long-term development. And it has made politics, it has shrunk politics back mm. and made it much more short-term in outlook than perhaps it has been before. So I think, um, if I may sum it up, the, the challenge you're posing to Chatham House as it looks to its second hundred years um, is very much to try to open the aperture at a time when politics and politicians are more and more obsessed about the near term. And we need to be able to provide that aperture out to the at least medium to longer term, connect the two um, I from think one side to the other. I think that puts it exactly. Yeah. And uh, I think there'll be no shortage of whether it's regions, we didn't touch on the Middle East, obviously we didn't touch that much on Russia, or issues from climate and so on, which are already on the Chatham House agenda. But I think we apply that uh, uh, um, outlook or that approach. Um, hopefully we will be um, as successful in what we're doing in the next 100 years as we have been uh, in the last few decades. Sir John, really we appreciate very much your time uh, sharing your thoughts and experience with us, setting out the, uh, <coughs> the scenery, but also a little bit of the mission. 
uh, which we will definitely uh, reinfuse with your thoughts. Thank mm. you very much for taking the time mm. and look forward to continuing to avail ourselves of your sound advice in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much.